Hey guys, Matt Noakes here. In this video, we're going to be talking about the five dimensions of what it takes to become a professional hitter. And as coaches, our deepest desire is to have a program that our players learn to be creative and get perspective and become more aware. Hitters that are able to understand their variables and to make adjustments on their own, to come up with their own way of hitting, their own hitting style, and to be able to move on, making adjustments, seeing things in the big picture. I talk about the pyramid of hitting here as it shows a pyramid um, because when I was a young player, I thought of it like this. Your greatest asset is your perspective and your awareness. It's your ability to see the big picture to see the whole thing all at once. When you have awareness, more awareness, it's like you have more experience because you're able to see things and sum them up into, into very simple ideas and concepts, into, into familiar movements, things that you, that, that, that you do in a lot of other things. And so your greatest asset is awareness and perception of what's going on around you. But your greatest ability or skill set is that automatic mind, is that ability to sum things up into one thing, and that's all a part of this awareness. As we train our bodies and, and we make every movement, it's like learning a dance. Our, our swing is like learning a dance. I mean, we have to learn every, every part of our swing. Our swing is one dance, it's one movement. It's a one fluid movement. Uh, that is made up of a lot of different parts. But in order to create that, of course, we had to uh, learn the movements one by one. Now, our careers, and as coaches, we need to encourage our young players as they come through, especially in season. In season, our players need to be able to come to us and they need to say, hey, what do, I, you, know, what do you see? And we need to be able to give them the big picture of what they see and not impose our own ideas, we'll try this, do this, do that, because they're already doing that. They, they're already come, trying to come up with solutions. If you find a player that is not trying to come up with solutions, I can guarantee you that he doesn't see the big picture. If you're chopping a tree, you see the big picture. Not only it does the tool look like what it does, and then the blade is set in such a way where you know you have to hit it at a certain way and you know that when you hit it you have to get your weight into it and so it's very intuitive and so as you're using an axe intuitively you're more aware because you you see the shape of the axe and you know what the job is and if we're going to be a player that's not aware of a whole lot um, more than likely you're going to be a player that is going to make a whole bunch of mechanical adjustments all the time random adjustments um, let's say you're jumpy when you're hitting and so you just keep ma making mechanical adjustments instead of coping with the pitcher. In other words, you're not dealing with the right things. You don't understand the variables. This awareness, I could say that as a player, I was more aware than probably the average guy, you know, I, I, and so I played in the big leagues. There's only been 18,000 Major League Baseball players to play in the big leagues in, in the 150 years. If we're talking about hitting, we're talking about half that. So, you know, we're talking about only 9,000 people to hit. Or, you know, of, of course there's some, you know, there's some pitchers that hit, but, but I'm just averaging. So we're talking about a select group. So um, what, what people tend to think is that everybody has the same information, that it's in the ether kind of, and that, um, you know, all us as coaches kind of think that we all have, have the same information. We've all been given the same information. I mean, I, I thought that when I was playing, you know, why didn't I think to ask some of the great players? I, I certainly had access. Uh, why didn't I ask them all the time, you know, what do you do? What are you thinking? You know, it's because I didn't have the awareness to go to them. Now, the way I felt was that I'm an expert in my own right. I had enough awareness to where when I was hitting well, I was the best hitter on the field. Even better than some of the hall, you know, hall of famers at the, you know, if they had a bad game and I had a good game, I, I you know, was playing better than them. But of course, a guy like a hall of famer is able to keep it more often, is able to access it more often. 
And then of course he's completely operating in his automatic mind. Your ability is developed as you're able to automate everything that you do, physical. Every physical thing that you do. And then that way you're able to continually look at the big picture. Like when you're chopping a tree, you're not thinking of a whole lot other than that tree falling and digging the, you know, uh, the V out of the tree and getting the wood out of that V, okay? And so you wouldn't be thinking as you're taking an up chop and as you're taking a down chop or as you're taking a straight chop, you wouldn't be thinking, okay, I gotta turn my hips and I gotta you know, adjust my grip and I gotta roll my top hand or I have to, you know, whatever. You're not gonna be thinking mechanically because you're, you're gonna do things efficient, you're gonna do things, you're going to bring everything with you, you're going to be efficient as you do it and you're not going to be inefficient and start thinking about things that, that, that don't pertain to what you're doing because you have the big picture. You know what position to get into, you know, fortunately the blades, you know, like right here. And so you're able to get your hands at a 90 degrees to the tree. It's that awareness that enabled me to become a big league hitter. Contrary to the popular belief that, oh, he's just a freak. Because it is so important to understand that if I had a time machine and I could go back in time, that I would tell myself 30 years of of the lessons that I learned. I wouldn't be going, you know, la, 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 don't tell me, don't tell me, don't talk to me. Like, like I was at times when a coach was trying to help me because they were trying to help me in a way that was, you know, we'll try this, do this, do that. And I'm, you know, immediately I knew it wasn't gonna work because I've tried everything. You get into the, um, you get into the batting cage and the guy starts throwing to you, there are eight to 10 things that you do automatically without even knowing, without even knowing what you're doing and you're able to manage these variables simply because the space between you is close and you can feel the distance. And timing is a distance and you're able to get in, in position and you're also able to have more awareness in your automatic mind and on, on a subconscious level and then end up getting into the right position on time and then you're able to take a nice, fluid, land, land swing, a, you know, stroke at it, you know. When I was playing, I didn't understand this, I didn't know, but I knew the movement. Now, when I was working, when I would work on my front side, I knew I had to keep it closed, okay? I'm strong here. I'm strong, I'm strong, and then it finishes, okay? I'm not strong if I do that. This is not strong, this is inefficient. This, this, this is inefficient and weak if I rotate my base, okay? Now you can see that, but you might not even be able to verbalize why you, you understand this. Other than the fact that you can put yourself in my place and go, yeah, that would feel weaker. Like if I'm gonna take a Frisbee and throw a Frisbee, and as I throw that Frisbee, if I were to open up, what would it do? It'd go like that. So you stay close and you fire it, and really, you think you're staying sideways, but you're really not. You're shifting your weight and your core is turning. Okay, your, your, your core is rotating, your shoulders are rotating, your upper half, your swing lever system is launching and rotating at, at the highest speed because your foundation is found it, it is securely into the ground and your transfer actually a lot frees you up and allows you to get into rotation and find one axis so if you want to be a coach that is efficient that lets your players develop naturally into natural hitters into hitters that are able to find their their stroke that's natural they're able to find their natural stroke they're able to hit like this, smooth, not just off the tee and in soft toss. I mean, shoot, when they're doing a, I mean, I don't care, even if you got someone that stops and starts and restarts, you have them doing a walking drill and they're, they're gonna be fluid. That's a fluid stroke. So, you know, to think that a player doesn't understand what a natural fluid swing is, I would, 
I would say, I would argue that they actually already know what it is and they know the feeling of it if you were to give them a certain drill. So it's not gonna, it's just like I gave the example of chopping a tree and how long it would take you to figure out how to, how to chop a tree and how to use an ax. Well, it wouldn't take you very long if you had a good, a good coach, someone who would be demonstrating it well, and you had the big picture of what you're trying to accomplish. We experience hitting in a way where, uh, you know, we don't necessarily articulate it. But as a coach now, it's your job to understand it on a level where you can show the category, show someone that they're, let's say maybe they're not coping with the pitcher's motion. They're not timing the pitch. They're not synchronizing, uh, you know, they're not coordinating the, their, their stride time with their, their stride time with their, sw with their swing flow. Um, whatever it is, you have to figure that, you have to understand that. But that doesn't mean that you tell your player, you know, try this, try that. You want to try to stay away from that. You want to be able to have, have, have taught them enough foundational things as you go, kind of little, little nuggets here and there. Um, the time to, to talk to them about maybe a mechanical nugget would be early hitting and say, but you have to understand what it relates to in the big picture so that they go, oh, well, that makes sense. It fits into their picture. And, and uh, so that's, that's the challenge. And as a, as a young player, this, this is why this pyramid, um, it, it meant so much to me as a young player because I didn't necessarily have this all worked out, but I definitely knew that there were, there were the pillars that held up this awareness and that the ultimate goal was to be able to sum up your feel and your automatic mind, all the movements so that it was one thought, one mind, one focus. I, were, I was able to summarize everything into a feeling that I was going to hit the ball hard. Just like that feeling that you get in soft toss, I'm standing over this ball right now because it's not moving and I can feel myself in the future hitting it hard. I can conjure this feeling of hitting it hard so I'm able to go execute it. You're able to execute something that you can imagine, all right? But if you can't do that, obviously, you're going to have trouble. If, you, if there's something, being able to coordinate the pitch time is much more difficult. And so there are going to be things that are going to get you strung out. There, there are things that you have to coordinate between pitch time and coordinate your stride time with your swing flow and actually, you know, synchronize the speed of the pitch and pick up the ball out of release and filter his motion and, and, and get in position. Things that you do naturally without even thinking, without even knowing you're doing it in soft time. This is an exciting thing. This is the first part of this pyramid is awareness. And as coaches, if we can become more aware and, if, and as, you, as you're open to more information, more experiences. If I had a time machine, I mean, think about this. I know that there were times when I felt like I didn't want to hear from a coach. I didn't want to hear what he had to say uh, because I knew that they were going in the direction of trying to tell me what to think or what to feel. And yet what I'm saying, I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that if I were to go back in time, I could actually give myself the experiences, the wisdom of what I went through and what, and give, you know, fill in the holes of perspective that I didn't know. Now, you may think that you are in the same place, that you've experienced that too, but if you haven't reached the highest level, you're not quite, you, you don't know if it's gonna work. And so that's what's so exciting for me to be able to share because I actually played at the highest level and I, so I'm able to, to share with you what works and what doesn't up at that level. Um, like I said, we're all able to play at the level, at the caliber of play that, that we kind of settled in at, and we most likely played well at one time or another. And so in those moments, we thought we did, or that we, that we know everything that we need to know. 
but, but then you go to the next level and you play at a higher caliber, then all of a sudden you, those things just get thrown out because now the variables become more difficult. All right, when you're looking at the big picture of hitting a baseball, I think if you break it down to its simplest concept, because we are looking big picture, we're trying to get the job done. We're trying to, we're trying to get hit. So what we want to have is flow and we want to have a repeatable swing. So basically we want to have a swing where we hit the ball at, at a depth that is consistent. Now, something to point out is that when you're taking soft toss, if you feel like your swing is changing, it's not repeatable, more often than not, you're hitting it at different, different depths. You're not paying attention to how far you're letting it travel. You're, you're, you're hitting a ball, maybe you're getting it on a 45 and one time you hit it here and the other time you hit it out there. And then you're feeling it feels different. You're saying it feels different. Well, it's because you're not hitting it this, at, at, at the same depth. If you, if you have a consistent depth, it's gonna feel consistent. And so it's important to have a repeatable swing. There were times when I was coaching in the minor leagues uh, with young prospects that ended up playing in the big leagues. And I remember this one young man, he, he got sent down and uh, he needed to, you know, he needed to work on some, some stuff. And um, he needed to kind of rebuild his swing. So he comes down and it's in July and he's hitting 195 and he's struggling. And I don't say anything and I let him, you know, he's kind of upset because he's, you know, he doesn't want to be down in, in high A ball. He thinks he should be in triple A, which he probably should be in triple A. But one of the things that he did was, is that I would be flipping him the ball underhand and he would hit eight ground balls in a row or it would take him eight swings to hit a line drive. And one of the things I said is, is I said, why does it take you eight swings to hit a line drive? And, he, and you know, he looked kind of puzzled thinking, you know, well, I'm just warming up. And I said, you don't get it. You have to have a reliable swing, a repeatable swing that you can count on. I mean, you're doing all this work to synchronize. You have to be ready while you're waiting in line to be able to hit that first pitch off the tee so that when you get in line and you're hitting with your coach here, first time you hit the first swing, you hit a line drive, you hit a laser on the first swing. You're able to imagine, you're able to conjure up what it takes and that feeling like I can stand here and feel what it's like in the near future to hit a ball, I can conjure up the, feel it, the, the, the feeling of a good ball strike. So it's important and, you know, and one of the things was, well, I'm just getting warmed up. Well, problem is, is that you have to find that repeatable swing so that you can hit the first ball off the tee, the first ball in soft toss, so that you're able to hit the first ball in live batting practice. First ball, I mean, you're in live BP, you should walk up to live batting practice and understand what you're doing so that you're also, now of course it's stretched out. It's not quite as stretched out as it is in the game, but it's stretched out more than soft toss. In soft toss, you can pretty much let it travel a consistent, a consistent depth or at least a depth that's, that you can handle. And if you focus on a depth that's consistent and you focus on a spot because your time is a distance. If, you, if a 90 mile an hour pitch goes this far, it, it's going to take a certain amount of time. This far, it's going to take longer. This far, it's not going to take as much time. Okay. So a ball that doesn't quite get to you is a slower pitch or it takes less or it's going to take more time to get to you um, than you were expecting it to get. If it gets by you, then it took less time, all right? Now, that, that, that doesn't mean he's throwing any faster or any harder. That just means your timing is off, all right? So it's important that good hitting is timing a ball to a spot, letting a ball travel to a spot, 
and then having a reliable, consistent flow, and then a repeatable swing so that you can hit it at a specific, a specific depth that is repeatable. So in the first swing in batting practice, you can hit a laser so that you can have the confidence when you get in the game. So that when you get a pitch to hit, you can hit a laser on that first pitch. The next thing is the rule of three. There are lots of rules of three and we'll be going through some of them. But once again, we're talking about the big picture. So I'm gonna give you just a couple examples of why it's important to know these things. Now, um, this rule of three, it's important to know because there's do's and don'ts. Things that you do and things that, that you, you, you that things that might happen, but you don't want to think about it, okay? Um, like the front, the, front, the front leg straightening out, okay? That's not something that you do consciously, because if you did, you'd end up doing that, all right? It stays bent, and then your core fires, and it straightens out, all right? That, that, so what you, something that you, you focus on and you do mechanically is you make sure you land flexed and soft so that your leg is flexed because as it's flexed it's gaining energy it wants to get straight because the core wants to fire it is storing energy it's like a pole vault that thing lands and hits the box and it, it's starting to bend and it's gaining energy as it goes all right so in this case this first rule of three i'm going to explain is you have three areas. You have your base, you have your core motor, and you have your swing levers. And these are your, these are attached to the bat. So your arms, hands, grip, and everything like that, including the bat. And you know, finding your plane. Now, it's important to note that I'm gonna just demonstrate it first and show you what I'm talking about. The swing, the swing happens down here by the waist and at the very top of the swing is up just under the shoulders okay but most young players think the swing is above the shoulders and they swing and they're too quick to get up into a high finish thinking that if they accomplish a high finish that they have accomplished something that that would be the mark of a good swing when in fact it's half a swing okay now as you can see I'm gonna swing underneath my shoulders now here's a swing so you got here's your base where you're able to shift your weight all right you can do it in a phone booth but you're able to shift your weight your swing does this your swing doesn't do this you don't want to swing like this up and down it wouldn't make sense to do this with your arms because your arms move this way Okay, here's your plane. Now, now I'm standing upright, but here's what happens when you swing flat underneath your shoulder, in between your shoulders and your, and your hips, which is really on the same plane as your core motor, your base core motor, swing levers. So you want to swing in the same plane as your core motor. All right, so, but, you know, if I'm going to hit a ball that's low and in, and I'm down here like this, you may think I'm finishing high when in fact, I'm, I'm really just swinging underneath my core motor here. If I were to straighten up, it would be right here, okay? It's still gonna be underneath my shoulders. But there are so many players that are determined to finish high thinking that they're gonna be doing something more. Far be it from me to say something about Miguel Cabrera, but I want you guys to think from now on, every time you watch Miguel Cabrera hit, I want you to take note of something that he does. We all agree he's probably one of the best hitters, if not the best hitter of the turn of the century, since, since the turn of the century. But if you notice, it's almost as if, you know, he would have been a great player if you were a coach because he could have whatever theory you would have had as a coach I'm sure he would have made you look good right because he could probably do anything you asked him to do and 
he would make your theory, even right or wrong, look good sim simply because he could feel a way to make it work. Now, one thing that I've noticed is that every time Miguel Cabrera swings and fouls a ball off, when he fouls a ball off, he lets go and finishes above his head. Every time. He fouls a ball off, he finishes up here. Every time he hits the ball, he finishes down low. Or he finishes on plane and continues to go. Right? It may finish up at shoulder height but with the barrel down below. But the idea is, is that he continues to swing in one direction. When he fouls the ball off, now, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what he thinks. I don't know what's going on in his head. But I have a sneaky suspicion that somewhere along the line, someone told him to finish high. And so, of course, in try, as a young player, there are some habits that, that you take with you throughout your major league career. And yet, when it's not, it may not be a movement that's natural. So, of course, when you execute, you're not going to do it the way that you think that you're supposed to do it because it's not the natural movement. But if you have some time to think about it or some time to react, like when you foul a ball off, foul a ball off, you may end up going like that. Okay, now here's why I'm saying this. Because the, the, the swing, uh, no one would question that the swing is supposed to be between the shoulders and the hips. There's no one that would disagree with that. No one would disagree. There's no one that would think that the swing is supposed to go halfway, halfway across the body, and then peel off and come up. There's no one that would think that you would pull halfway and finish high. So like this. Yet you see a lot of guys swing like that think because they think that they're doing something positive. They're accomplishing something, finishing high. When in fact, you're supposed to just swing on plane. You're supposed to finish your plane. You look at Robinson Cano, Barry Bonds, Miguel Cabrera. When they make contact, they finish here. Okay? They continue the swing. The swing continues on the same plane that they hit it. It only makes sense. I mean, why would you peel off? Why would you take half a swing? So that's context. That's important to know. Okay? Because with all the abstract feels that you're going to gather, doing all the different drills that you're going to do, I mean, let's take, for example, a front toss drill. I'm sorry, a top hand drill. Okay, so you got your top hand and you're going to hit a ball with one hand, right, with your top hand. Are you going to swing with your top hand and finish high? Are you going to go like this? Your arm would break off. No, you're going to hit it and you're basically going to hit it and rotate and finish down here because that's where it wants to go. Okay, your bottom hand is free to finish up a little bit. And so when, when you swing with two hands, they're able to counteract and you're able to keep it underneath the shoulders. Now that bottom hand doesn't necessarily want to get above the shoulders. That would be coming off the ball or that, excuse me, that would be coming off the plane, off the swing plane. So the rule of three is you have your base, you got your core motor, it's high ballistic core motor, as long as you have a nice land swing and you keep a fluid motion, you're gonna see where the swing flow, where the swing flow and the swing plane enter and exit on one uh, um, flat plane in between your shoulders and hips. Another idea that's important to understand in the big picture is blocking. And so many times there's not enough time between pitches to explain what you're trying to say, to communicate what you're trying to say. And you can either make it complicated for a hitter or you can keep it simple for a hitter. And so one of the things I, I use it, it are sounds. Very simple, boom, boom, boom. The first of the booms is when I transfer my weight, just like throwing. That would be the first boom right there. When all that energy right there, boom! All that energy leads into a torque. Here's my torque right there. I don't have any torque right here. There's no, 
there's no load here. There's no torque here. The torque happens when I land right there. Here's when I start to torque. So when I, I call it spiking the scale. If I had a scale right there, the scale would spike. That energy, the weight shift, all right? So spike the scale. Even if I do a no stride, release, boom. I want to shift my weight and have a nice fluid boom, 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 okay? So the first boom would be my weight shift into my front side. The second boom would be going off of that first boom, that first weight shift, and using that energy, converting it to rotary, using my core motor, turning, uh, tr uh, translating my, my rotation into high ballistic core turn by adding a weight shift, and then boom, my core fires. It's a high ballistic turn because of the timing of it. So it's boom, boom. The second boom is the weight into the ball. It's not the turn, but it's farther down the line. First boom is here. Second boom is when I actually get my weight into the ball. Okay? If you don't get your weight into the ball, if you hit the ball, if, you're, if you stay in the middle, okay, and I know that staying in the middle is something that you can think of and it can be helpful, all right? Um, but if it's making you, if it's forcing you to not get your weight into the ball, that's called quitting. So if I hit the ball without weight, that's slapping. That's slapping. If I were to chop a tree without my weight, what would that be doing? That would be slapping the tree. What I want to do is I want to hit it, I want my weight to be translated up through my body, in through the bat, into the tree. In this case, into the ball. So that's the second boom. The third boom is a movement that the highest level players do naturally. Even when they're in a downhill approach, even when they go out and get a ball, so it's boom, boom, return. Where not as players that aren't as advanced, they're gonna go boom, boom, Boom. It's going to be a slow return, if they return at all. Like throwing, for example, is a, called a soft block, I like to call it, or throwing block, because it's boom, boom. Getting your weight into the barrel or getting your weight through the ball, all right? So boom, boom. There's, there really is no return. But I don't have to synchronize a pitch, okay? I'm trying to synchronize a pitch within the near, nearest couple feet here. So I need to block firmly enough so that my axis can, can hold a spot in space so I can rotate around it. And the firmer that I block, the more confidence that I'll have and the harder I can rotate my core, not my base, my core, you know, your base follows your core, but you, you don't want to rotate your core. I'm sorry, you don't want to rotate your base. You want to rotate your core and have your base follow it because it's flexible and it gets turned. The lower body gets turned, but it stays basically roughly sideways. It starts to turn a little bit because your core turns, right? But it gets turned, all right? So the boom, 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 is a way to communicate to your players to where they understand once you know when, once you take the course and understand every facet in, in, in every way to explain to teach how to block effectively then you'll be able to communicate to your players in a way where you say well your swing is like this ba boom boom and then that would be a leak all right now, you can do this at any tempo. So if I'm going to do it real slow, I can go boom, boom, boom. As long as they're at the same tempo, that's fine. Boom, boom, boom. So I can practice my swing as long as I'm going boom, boom, boom. That's all at the right tempo. Okay. But in, a, in the game, it's not going to be like that. It's going to be boom, 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 boom. Okay? Boom, boom, boom. It's going to return that fast. So if I go boom, 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 that's a leak. And that means my axis was rotating in a wobble. All right? And that's going to 
that's going to mean that my wherever I let the ball train, wherever I let the ball um, travel to, I moved. You know, the ball's moving too, but if I moved and I expected the ball in a certain place and I was expecting my body to maintain an axis and I don't do it, well, then I'm not going to have a repeatable swing. Okay. So you're able to communicate in a sound. Now, once again, this is just showing you how to teach in a way that gives feedback for the player to learn himself, the player to, to discover answers for himself. And, and for to feel it himself, because you don't want to give a person a feel, you want the person to experience it themselves. You want them to be able to come up to you and say, how does it look? What do you see? All right, once again, and that's the in season, that's how you in season um, coach a player in and out, but in season, it's vital that you, you, you stick to the regimen of of, of allowing the player to feel what he feels, all right? So an example of a, a boom, boom, boom swing would be like this. Boom, boom, boom. At the very foundation of hitting, the very foundation of the actual swing, we have um, the idea of lining up our levers and knowing how to how to fold and unfold you know fold and unfold our arms how to cock and uncock our wrists um, that's something that has to be taught um, some players intuitively can relate it to maybe let's say chopping a tree swinging a sledgehammer and they don't need to be taught they just intuitively know but if you've never done that, if you've never experienced that, you don't have that skill set. You don't have that move that's natural. You don't have that understanding. And so therefore, you either have to have all your, have all your guys go out and split wood or chop down trees, or you need to explain to them how to fold and unfold. Because a lot of times, guys will go like, they'll bring the bat like this and then slide it. Well, that's, a, you know, that, that's creating slack. Your, your swing doesn't do this. It doesn't do that. It, 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 it's wherever it is in your stance, it's gonna fold up and unfold like you're swinging a hammer. You don't swing a hammer like this. Ultimately, our mechanics are going to be led by our ability to, to code our movements and our ability to access our subconscious mind, which means we have to have an ability to train, to understand the big picture of the movements, and then to be able to create rehearsals for the movements. Because as soon as I can rehearse, for example, as soon as I can rehearse where I'm going and how, it, how I want it to feel at contact, like for example, you know, as you can see, when I rehearse contact, I feel my weight into the ball. So I go like this. Even though when you see me hit, I'm gonna be in the middle. But when I rehearse it, I wanna feel my weight into the ball because I'm not moving. And since I'm not moving, I wanna feel a weight shift into it. I don't wanna feel this because this would feel like quitting. I don't wanna feel, I don't wanna be in the middle when I, when I try, try to feel the sensation of contact. So it's all about learning how to code your swing into your subconscious. I mean, everything is code. Your DNA is code. Everything that you do is code. Shoot, you're brushing your teeth. You know, you, you know you're going up and down and you're, you're conscious of the, of the patterns on your teeth and, and you're zoomed in and then all of a sudden you zoom back out and you're thinking about your day. You go in and out. Okay, so that's your conscious mind and your automatic mind, right? You're able to think about, so you work on something, you understand what you're doing, you understand what the variables are, and then you work on it. You know, if you want to work on it, your top hand, if you want to work on how your, how your top hand works, if you don't want, you know, some guys are front arm dominant and they don't ever work on their weak hand and all they do is hit two-handed and so this top hand can pull their swing off plane 
and they have to fight and fight and fight to get their bat to stay on plane. Instead, what they need to do is learn how this arm is supposed to work, folding and unfolding. And then I go here, it rotates through while I keep the barrel in my wrist at the proper angle with palm forward. And as I release it and strike the ball, it's going to finish down lower. It's not going to swing and finish up like that. It's going to finish. That wasn't very good. It's going to finish here, right, you know, right in this area. That's where it wants to go naturally. Okay? So what you want to do is you want to work on it. All right? And what that does is it programs it. But you have to know what it is. You have to know what it is you're working on. You have to get the big picture and understand your levers. And you want to be teaching your players what these things are and have the different groups and the different uh, hitting stations so that, so that they have a nice, well-rounded uh, swing. So overall, we want to have a consistent swing flow. We want to understand what we're doing in general in the big picture and we want to understand how to train and then ultimately rehearse. Because if we can get to the rehearsal, then our minds have now put it in our automatic mind. It is now automatic. If we can rehearse something, it is at that point automatic. But rehearsing is summarizing it into one thought, one feel, one position, and it sums everything up. And at that point, it's just automatic. And that's your goal because that's something that you can do in the, uh, um, in the batter's box, you know, maybe a square swing, you know, you, you see the big leaguers swing with the barrel above their hands on deck. Well, that's something that you can do in the batter's box. So anything that you can do in the batter's box is a rehearsal. And when you can do that, then you got something going for you. So that's the ultimate goal is to train your mechanics in a way that you have a bunch of do's, not don'ts. You want to focus on, on what you do, not on what you don't do. Um, there are a lot of people that look at what the movement looks like at third person from the outside. And let's say they see the front leg straighten. So they think, oh, a straight front leg is important. Well, you would not take something heavy and throw it up into a truck and straighten that front leg. It just would not be a natural movement. No, you keep it bent and you keep shifting. And if you, as you keep rotating, it'll straighten out. But you don't think straight front leg. It's not a do. It's something that gets done, it gets turned, and then as it turns, it posts up and straightens out. But that's the difference between a do and a don't. The touchstones, or old school, the absolutes, um, are, are the do's. They're the anecdotes um, that are a positive. There are things that you do. They are action steps. And in the certification mastermind group, or mastermind court, the coach's mastermind, we go over the 12, 12 touchstones, which cover all of hitting. There's actually a 13th, which is the plan, which is in the background of every touchstone. But in those 12 categories, you have everything you'd want to know about hitting because everything is related to timing. Hitting is timing and pitching is interrupting that timing. And every one of the touchstones has a timing element to it. Um, culminating with the third one being the ride and stride, which is the manifestation of your stride timing. This is how you lock in. It's the ride called the ride and stride. Um, but you cover we we cover all the mechanical and the timing elements of of hitting with the twelve with the twelve touchstones with a thirteenth in the background, a little bit in each one a little bit of the plan, a little bit of how you uh, focus and think about um, what you're doing, about your perspective as you're going about your business. As we're talking about the touchstones, the do's, the touchstones are not only physical things that you do, they are also perspective things. I call, you know, um, your, one of the touchstones could be an approach thing. Now we're going to talk about the 12 touchstones 
in the coach's entry level certification where there's 12 categories. In those 12 categories, you could break it up into another, another 12 sections, but for simplification reason, because you, you want to hit, you want to just go grab a bat and hit. You want to keep it simple and you want to have areas that you're developing and working. And as long as you have a surface knowledge of how these things work, then the, the, um, all the pieces that you can maybe break up and refine a little bit more and more can be developed as you go. But you don't have to complicate it. You can keep it really simple, which is why we just do the 12 touchstones with the 13 touchstones in the background. I was talking to a friend of mine that is a Hall of Famer, and, and uh, we were talking about how you have to come up with language with words to describe what the experience was like, which is why I came up with the touchstones. Um, it, their do's, their action steps, you know, you have to, you have to define your terms. Um, and, and it's helpful to talk about it in, in, I have found that it's helpful to talk about it in that format because you can keep things in separate categories so if you're struggling in one area you know what area that is and then you can work on it. You can find a rehearsal and you can fix it and you can make an adjustment. Otherwise it's just random, you don't know what you're doing. Otherwise you're hitting and you're strung out and you're changing your stance, you're changing your grip, you're changing where your hands are instead of understanding maybe you're not coping with the pitcher well, well why are you adjusting your stance or why are you adjusting your grip? why don't you just cope with the picture a little bit better, all right? So the touchstones, the action steps, the do's, they're anecdotes, they're positive things that you need to know and they help you work through. They're the, they're, they're the proactive steps that you take to develop yourself as a hitter. They're the proactive steps that you take to develop as a hitter and they encompass all levels of hitting, all the dimensions of hitting of the awareness, mechanics, timing, the plan, and the touchstones and the ride and stride. Well, the timing is the ride and stride. The timing, of course, everything is timing. And, you know, it's easy to say it's a blanket statement of timing. Well, it's all timing. And, and very few people understand what that means. And, but yet you have to be able to communicate what you, what you mean as a, um, as a coach. So you have to know the six timing touchstones, okay? Even though that's one touchstone in the 12, you have to know the six areas of what you're facing from the pitcher's delivery to release to the time of the pitch to the stride time to coordinating the swing time or your stride time with your swing time and then matching your swing time with the pitch time. You know, there's all sorts of things. You know, you have to know which area you're, that, you're, that you're screwing up on. You know, if you're having a hard time, you want to know what area you need to work on. You just don't want to make random adjustments that don't relate to what you're doing. And that's generally what we've done. And I did this. Uh, is we make adjustments that are based on random feel that that just familiar things that we you know we cycle through familiar feels and we try to get them to work. We try to force a feel to work um, that that worked before. When in fact, what we should do is we should understand what our movements are. We should understand what timing is. We should understand our ride and stride so that we're able to practice and, and, and watch a pitcher warm up and get the beat of his speed and get the beat of his release and understand it so that when we do all our rehearsals, we can find out what it feels like today. Some of the best advice I got as a player in the big leagues was don't, don't try to find your swing or the feel of your swing from last year, last month, last week, or even yesterday. Find the feel today. Do your work, do your movements, do your rehearsals, and find out how it feels today. You, you, know, you're do, you know you're doing all your moves right. Do your drills. <laughs> Whatever that felt like, that's what you bring into the game. You don't bring in a whole bunch of routines. You don't bring in a rehearsal even. 
you bring in the ultimate feel that you got, summed up feel of everything. Just like you do when you hit soft toss. What do you do when you hit soft toss? You don't even think of anything. You just go in there and just want to hit it hard. It just overwhelms you. You're, you're managing variables because your timing is so good. Because the space between you is so close that you can feel the depth, you can feel the distance, and the distance actually equals the time. So timing is a distance. And so our ride and stride is the actual physical part of understanding how to, you know, our ride, our ride is ready. Our ride is what we do when the pitcher's in his windup, whether it's a high kick and we're on our backside and we hold our backside, whether they're, but, it, but it's, all, it's always slightly forward. It's always slightly ready to go forward or, or on our backside, cocked, like we're ready to run a race, but ready to go at a, at a moment's notice. And we're riding, it's generally right before release, we're already flowing toward the pitcher. And then the stride is when we let go. And when we let go, it's the part, that's the commitment portion. So the ride and stride. The commitment portion is the part that is, that we have to time. So the ride we can hold, and then when we let go, we have to, the swing timeline has to be short. Um, and as uh, um, how, we, how we perceive the motion uh, has to have short timelines so that we're able to, let me give you an example of that. Um, if, if the pitcher's uh, throwing motion is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, you wouldn't stand here and go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You wouldn't do that. You would go, you'd filter, 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 nine, ten. You, you wouldn't, you, <laughs> you keep the timeline short. All right. You don't even, I mean, that's what you do when you play catch. You don't, you don't think about all that other stuff. All right. So that's timing in a nutshell. The plan is, is you make your money off the fastball. You make your money off the pitch when that pitcher is trying to get ahead of you. All right. The best pitch in baseball is a fastball. And generally, it's a fastball low and away. Of course, it's going to work you in and, and do other things. But the most predictable pitch early in the count is a fastball low and away. And if you can put that pitch down the middle reach, then that's what good hitters do. Good hitters, as a catcher in the big leagues for 10 years, every good hitter that I faced could handle a fastball, one ball to two balls off the plate, it was down the middle reach to them. Now they, you know, they could put it down the middle reach. Definitely a ball on the black was down the middle reach to them in a lean. In other words, they'd swing, they'd stride straight, but they'd swing and then catch themselves on a ball low and away like that. Because they're leaning on the ball. All right. Um, and then a ball inside, they cut the corner in different counts. But Early in the count, it's about not missing your pitch. Being a good hitter, the plan is to not miss your pitch. When you get your pitch, the plan, the plan is, is to be able to visualize what's coming. Not only just visualize the pitch, you know, what's coming like the fastball or a curveball, but to visualize what it's going to look like to be able to put yourself in that situation just like you do when you're hitting soft toss. When you're hitting soft toss, whether you know it or not, you visualize the trajectory that it's coming in and what it's gonna look like before it actually happens. So that when you get that pitch, when's the last time you froze on a pitch in soft toss? You don't freeze in soft toss, why? Because it's predictable. And then it, it, it you, you get, the toss that you expected to get. And so you don't freeze, you don't quit on it. Um, you know, a lot of times when a player will, will uh, freeze on the ball, you know, with two strikes is because he's, he's not focusing on what he's supposed to be focusing on. 
and, and, and there's a plan, there, there is a educated way of looking for different trajectories so that you're able to create the largest zone with two strikes and yet not miss your pitch when, he, when you get it. The last thing you want to do is have your zone so big that you don't hit your pitch. I mean, ultimately, it's never get beat on your pitch. That's the plan. Never, ever, ever. As a matter of fact, I would rather be horrible at everything else except my pitch and yet be great at my pitch and never miss it. You could be, you could, you know, you, you're a 300 hitter if you do that. You're a 300 hitter if you don't miss your pitch. As a matter of fact, you have to be somewhat a hitter like that to be a major league hitter. To be a major league hitter, someone asked me, uh, a little while ago, a couple years ago, what is it that defines a major league hitter? And I said, well, what's when everybody knows? And what are you talking about? Well, when, the, when your manager knows, when the other pitcher knows, when your teammates know, when uh, uh, the coaches know, that when you get your pitch, they can count on you hitting your pitch. That you are a guy that they know that can hit a pitch that they're looking for. And if you're, but if you foul it off every once in a while, you know, if you're a guy that fouls it off, that doesn't, there, no one's impressed and you're not a big league hitter if you do that, okay? Now, that's a fine line between a guy who can do it and a guy who can't. It's the guy who, who understands that that's what's important to not miss a pitch. I mean, if you don't know that that's not important, you know, if you think that that's not important, then you're going to end up being a guy that, that ends up you know, playing AAA his whole career. So you got to understand that, you, you know, number one, I'd rather get beat on a pitcher's pitch than make an out on my pitch. But that's something that you have to know in your heart, that you're willing to get beat on your, or on a pitcher's pitch, because you will not compromise getting beat on your pitch. The worst thing that can ever happen is for a pitcher to throw you your pitch and for you to foul it off or miss it. That's the worst thing that can happen. As a matter of fact, that's, that's a reflection on you as a hitter or getting a pitch and going bing, 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 not being consistent with it. What good hitters do when they get a pitch that they like, they not only like their pitch, but they have a, a, a certain depth that they hit it in and they try to attack it, and a good number of times they hit it at a certain depth that they're comfortable hitting it at. And then if it gets a little deeper, it goes the other way. If they hit it further out front, they pull it a little bit more, right? But, but they, hitters gen generally have some tendencies because of this. So that wraps up the five dimensions of a professional hitter, and it's just giving you some background, some, some feeling of what it's like to understand the big picture because as we understand the big picture we're able to start working on the little things and develop we don't want to develop with a magnifying glasses are where we don't see the big picture everything has to be in relationship to the big picture now I encourage every coach that wants to take this to the next level to, to put their hand up let us know um, go up and click the box where um, we talk about the, the coach's mastermind. If the, co if the class is closed, you definitely let us know that you're interested in it. And so the next time we open up the course that you can, you, know, you can be a part of it. But let us know because uh, we'd love for you to be a part of the family, being part of the certification, the group of certified, certified coaches across the country that are high level coaches, highly trained coaches, that understand this game on, a, on another level. And we have coaches all throughout the college ranks, the professional ranks. And, and uh, ultimately, I want you to have the confidence to, to, to be able to develop a hitter, to diagnose what he's go what's going on, and give them suggestions of the touchstones, of the do's, the action steps, um, the, uh, the routines, and also, of course, ultimately, the rehearsals. If you can give a player a rehearsal, if you can identify what part of the hitting approach that a hitter is struggling in, and you understand that, you know, what it is, and you can convey that to a player, and then you can not only give them a routine, but give them a rehearsal, 
then they can enter that into their automatic mind related to a movement they already know and, and ultimately make adjustments right away.